Allen live in one minute. Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Hello, hello, and welcome to uh, the post-Thanksgiving rest of the year. It is uh, November 26th. It's sunny out. It's Monday. We won't mention the fact that both my football teams lost ignominiously yesterday. <laughs> How... <laughs> And I need to introduce my guest. My guest is Teresa Brown. She is um, many things, uh, but she is here in her guise as author of an incredible book called Critical Care, A New Nurse Faces Death, Life, and Everything in Between, and uh, truer words were never, were never written. But we got to start with... Um, uh, how you got this woman had a career. She'd done a lot of education <laughs> to have this career. She had a PhD in English, English. and she'd landed a really nice, nice teaching job. She was a professor at at Tufts. Tufts. Yeah. I was going to put you at Rutgers for some reason. Tufts, which always struck me as a very odd name. It is an odd. What name. does it come from? What is it? It's someone's name. It is it's someone's real name. name. Yeah, Mr. Tufts. Yeah, but my husband would always call it Tufts of Hair University. Because <laughs> that is the only Tuft you ever think of. Yeah, right. <laughs> Tufts of Hair, you. I like that. So, uh, you're teaching um, all these, you know, eager, smart young people how to write. How to write, yes. How to write. And were you tenured? I was not, no. Oh, okay. No. Well, there's a little. There you go. There, yeah. there, that's why. <laughs> so she was living a very insecure existence as an untenured professor. What happened? She's a nurse. She is an oncology nurse. You you threw away all of that. I did. And went back to school I did. to become a nurse. And in the status conscious society we live in, even though we pretend we're not status conscious, Going from a professor at Tufts yes. to a nurse. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. In Pittsburgh is seems like a downward trajectory. It can be looked at that way, although I don't look at it that Good. way. Yeah, yes. I think you're absolutely right. Yes. But ex so explain how it happened. I mean, or why you did it. Or Right. So the truth is I kind of slowly realized I really didn't want to be a professor for the rest of my life. My dad's a philosophy professor, and I think it seemed like a great life. And, uh, and then once I was doing it, it just, it was okay, but it didn't... You weren't passionate. I wasn't, no. I loved my students, but no, I was not passionate. It was a job. Yeah, it was. But a lot of people go through their entire lives, and they're certainly not passionate about what they uh, are doing. Just look at Jess, for instance. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm in a, I'm obnoxious. Well, um, either that I'm more ambitious or more impatient, more impatient than the average person, or a little of both. You wanted more. You I want, did. But I what did. gave you the hint that there was something more? What made you do it? Because it would be something that when you told everybody, "This is what I'm going to do," they'd say, "Are you crazy?" Right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So yeah. What What was the thing that pushed you? So it was really becoming a mom. And I, I feel like saying this, I don't want to sound really retro, like I was being a mom and I found out I was could be all warm and fuzzy inside. But that's true. But being warm and fuzzy in a very concrete way 
and you know um, there there can be a lot to being warm and fuzzy, and especially when you're tired. And uh, so I found that, and then I got pregnant with twins, and had the twins, and I just even though it was awful in some ways, like in some ways it was awful. <laughs> What, was, having them or you know what what was awful just having, so the twins don't end up in a psychiatric exactly ward. exactly what, what uh, you mean? having well our son was two and a half when the twins were oh born. lord yeah that's so we had awful. three kids in diapers <laughs> yeah yeah that's awful yeah but I really <laughs> fell in love with just being in what I call the soup of life like all the mess and the chaos and the warmth and the humanity and the real the real life yes life. yes not. Academics, not the sort of sanitized. Let's spec. Right, I, you're right. Oh, I could see you. You don't. You don't want to put down the academic life. But, I guess but since my husband's a professor, I should be a little. Her husband <laughs> isn't. I forget. <laughs> I forget the adjective in front of it, but I remember the noun. I think I do. Astrophysicist. Yes. Yes. God, what was the one in front of it? Th- uh, there, oh, there was theoretical. The- oh, yes. Theoretical. Oh, speaking of off in La La yes. Land. Right. <laughs> <laughs> theoretical astrophysicist. So he is very passionate about that. That's good. But for me, yes, the world of ideas just... Doesn't do it. It does not. No. You want your. You not. want to get your hands dirty. I do. I okay, do. Okay, well, you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> So here's the other odd thing. You have three children in diapers, and you decide that you want to become a nurse, which means you have three children in diapers, and you have to go to school. Yes. Well, how the heck do you do that? I did one class every semester. I had to do a whole bunch of science classes because, of course, my background, I had no training in science. Um, And the truth is I loved those classes. I loved how objective they were. I loved how there was a right and a wrong answer. Hmm. So you, both sides of your brain work then. You, 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 you have a right side and they a left do. side. See, I'm, I don't, one of my sides does not function. They don't always talk to each other all that well, but they yeah. do both so work. So you could do the science and yeah. you enjoyed that too. I did. That's yeah, neat. I did. So I took one class a semester at Rutgers. We were living in New Jersey. Um, and ah, that's where Rutgers came then from. the kids were all going to be in school. And then we ended up moving to Pittsburgh because my husband got a job at, at Pitt. And then I did Pitt's accelerated nursing program. So, oh, and then I have to put in a plug. For, so for people who don't know, accelerated <laughs> programs are for people like me who already have degrees in other fields. And you can actually get a nursing degree pretty quickly. So, huh. yeah, if you, if you take these science classes that you need. Okay, well, you have to do that first. And then the right. accelerated things, what, takes how long once you have At that Pitt, science? At it's a and, year. In a year, you can be an RN? Yeah, it's a crazy, <coughs> crazy year. Most programs are a little bit longer. Yeah. So it's very concentrated. Yeah, oh, yeah. And that's really tough. Like with, molasses, but yeah. with all the fluid drained out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. See, yeah. she's, got a, she's got a way with words. And, okay, so all of a sudden, you're not only just doing this, but you're writing about it because you can't quite leave the, that part of your academic life behind. You like to write. It's how I do. You, yeah. And you're good at it. Oh, thank you. So when did you start to write and Yeah, that nurse? was another, um, no, I shouldn't say accident, but I had this terrible experience at work and ended up writing it down. And then that article became the Condition A chapter in the book. Right. But it was shorter, and um, I just decided to write down what happened. Not, it, as, you, not as a therapeutic thing, but I thought, if I can contain this on three pieces of paper, I can contain my emotions around it, which doesn't work, I found out. But it seemed it like doesn't. a good idea. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. It can it, help. But it, it, it helps sorts it out. It helps. Sort it, it out oh, a little. definitely helps. Yeah. But so you re- wrote that, and then the teacher and you said, "Hmm, that's pretty damn good." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd give that baby an A. <laughs> yeah. So you sent it off. You know, not you sent it off to the New York Times. I did. Yes. And they printed it. They did. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and the rest is history because everybody saw that it was, in fact, extremely good. Oh, thank you. And then, you know, publishers came calling and all this. And you ended up with what? A, you have a you contribute to a blog or it is there? Well, how, yeah, well, what, now, what I happened? used to, I, yeah, I started writing for the Well blog, which it's is called a, Well Well at the New York Times. And then recently I switched over to Opinion. So now I'm on the Opinionator blog blog, which okay. I think is a hilarious Okay, I'll title. check it out. Opinionator. I don't even, opinionator yeah. is strange. So my column is called Bedside. Okay. And, it's, so it's, and how often do you stick things in there? Usually once a month. Yeah, roughly once a month. Yeah. Okay. Now, did the book come from all of the sort of entries into, I mean, is, is this somewhat a compilation of some of your, or no, not? No, there's, so. f- there's a little bit of overlap, but mostly that's um, all my first year. And it, yeah, and it all came out in a rush. Like I wrote it really quickly, which I've heard happens with first books, but I think it's just because the, the memories were so overwhelming that I just wanted to get them all down on paper. And what's fascinating is I've met women who've been nurses for 20 years who say they read my book and it brought their their first yeah. year. Compl- like everyone's first year has a lot of the same things happening, even though I felt like, no, it was mine. It was unique. It was It was really, really great to learn that I spoke to the experience that so many nurses had. You have this crazy first year, you start out, you feel like you know nothing. You know, even I mean you have your degree and you do know things, but you feel like you know nothing and well and you know, people well, die and other stuff, you know, families come in and are upset and you get injured yourself and you know, all this stuff. So um I uh, I have to tell you. Um I don't think okay, so I could not do this. I could not do this. And I remember, I remember panicking back when I was in my uh, late teens and going off to college because that was the pre-feminist era. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> I really felt there were like three things I was able to do. Right. Not able, but allowed to right. do. Teacher, nurse, and secretary? You got it. Okay. <laughs> I don't have the patience to be a teacher. I didn't think I could ever be a nurse. And so I did, in fact, become a secretary and was a yeah. secretary for many, many, many years. But why wouldn't you become a doctor with your astrophysicist <laughs> husband? Right. Uh, that's the other million dollar question, right? So I did think about it. Yeah. I did. Yeah. And at that point, I had three young kids <clears throat> and didn't want to go through what I'd have to go through to become a doctor. But the truth is, I really fell in love with bedside nursing. I really did. That was the fit. It was. You're you're happier being a nurse than you would ever have been being a doctor? I think so. I mean, there's times I would love to have all the training they have and know everything they have, and um, that would be great. But no, I like it. I like being in the mix with people and really spending a lot of time with them because doctors unfortunately don't get to spend a lot of time with patients well we won't get into why that is yeah well i mean individual pa- they spend okay, a lot yeah, of time individ- with patients, patients but not but no i mean they're they're everything's rushed and i right. don't know um you know what i hate about and here's where a nurse it makes so much sense you're dealing with an entire real human being you see their families yeah. You deal with their bodily functions. Doctors just deal with, like, the one thing that they have expertise about. You know what I mean? You go to one doctor for your foot. You go to another doctor for your head, another doctor for... And no one looks at you holistically. You, as a nurse, it would seem, would have to. Yeah, and that's a really good nurse can make a huge difference that way, especially for a patient in the hospital. And I think people don't realize that, that it's the nurse whose whose job is, not just inclination, but actual job, to keep track of all these things, all these different teams. What is urology saying? What did neuro say? What is ortho weighing in on? I mean, all this stuff, you know, and you can make a huge, huge difference in the quality of care that people get. Um, And unfortunately, often we don't have the time either to do that as well as we could, but... 
I have heard that if you want a job in this economy, like being a, a, getting a nursing degree would be a really good idea. First of all, the population's aging. We're all going to end up needing nursing care. On the other hand, I hear that nurses are overworked. So... What's going on here? I, you don't want to talk about this stuff. No, I can tell. No, no, okay. no I'm okay. happy Because, to I mean, but, but really, if there's so, I would imagine. No, that's. Why can't they do it so that, what's the optimal thing? You as a nurse would have how many patients to deal with on your shift? Optimally. For, when I worked in stem cell, I would say three. Okay. Um, we would have three, sometimes usually four. And four is doable, but depending on the four, four can be too many. Um, Three means you have time. You have time to look up and really read what someone's CT scan said. You have time to look at their labs with them and tell them what they mean. You know, you have time to really help people learn about what's happening to them rather than feel like they're just going from test to test to test and a lot of hurry up and wait and what's happening and this person came in and said this and then this person came in and contradicted it and do you remember who it was someone in a white coat you know no i know it's it's, it's, if you're a patient people are popping in every two seconds you can't tell you know back when nurses wore little nurse caps and little white dresses we knew who you were yeah, people say that to me. Well, but it is yeah, true. Yeah, and now yeah. you can't tell a nurse from the from the doctor, from the person who comes in to mop the floor. Yeah, I was just at Cleveland Clinic giving a talk, and they have all their nurses wear white, and that's why the nurses all wear white, and they only wear white. And they said it's made a huge difference in yeah. how patients feel. I don't. Then they know who the nurse is. I have always maintained that you don't go to a hospital to get well. You go to a hospital to get sick. I mean, hospitals seem like a really bad place to be. They, yeah, we're not doing what we need to do to keep them safe. Huh. We're not, yeah. And one of the things that's starting to come out is actual evidence and research that shows if nurses are not overstretched, you actually get a lot better physiological and health outcomes. Oh, that's hardly a big shot. Yeah, it's not. It's not. But this is research being done by Linda Aiken at UPenn, and she's incredibly thorough and, you know, looked at California where they have staffing ratios and found that if you make sure there's always enough nurses for patients, mortality goes down. Yeah, you have a better outcome. Right. Duh. Right. Yeah. Now, one of your chapters, you talk just about your day. Okay, here's a typical nurse's day. You sure you didn't pad that? <laughs> I mean, you took, uh, you know, a real I did. I did of a take, day. I did. I did. Okay, well, yeah. sure you did. I, yeah. I, I, but, my God, you're running from pillar to post. And we, we want to say that you're, you were an oncol- oncology nurse, which meant the people there, all your patients were... Very ill. Very sick, yeah. Very sick. Yeah. And in need of care. Um, You have to make judgment calls. Right. What to do now, how to make this happen, right. Where where to be. You got to keep your eye on your watch because so-and-so's got to have this at that time. Meanwhile, so-and-so is doing something else. One of your patients is desperate for help. You, it just seems like unbelievable, constant stress. Yes. And yeah, I picked a whiz bang of a day, but it's funny thinking back on it. I think of that as a good day because you were doing what you want to do. Yeah. And then at the end, when I talk about taking six minutes or eight minutes to actually listen yeah, to a Springsteen song with a patient who was going home, a moment like that can just make a day perfect. And that was a judgment you made because you really didn't have seven minutes to listen to these right. long songs, but you did. Yeah, yeah. You did. And it's it's the whole reason why I love the job. Okay, this is where I want you to start reading something. So then you went home, and mm-hmm. you're saying that was a good day, and you say, I changed into my regular shoes, got my bag out of my locker, and swiped out. And then in the elevator, one of the doctors who you'd interacted mm-hmm. with that day actually said, good job. Yeah. To you, which just was amazing. It's also really, really nice. Yeah. So, and, okay, so I'm going to let you start reading from, and, and then she says, and suddenly the whole day seemed worth it. I had done something well after all. I had even been effective. And then I want you to read. Aw. <clears throat> because. Okay. 
Because here's the truth. These four patients are all now dead. Tom went first, dying from acute respiratory failure just a couple of weeks after this day and after several more trips back and forth from the ICU. Peter died rather suddenly a few months later. He went septic and the shock killed him. His death hit me hard. He had already lost his mother and father to cancer. When I was his age, my biggest worries were whether I would get an A on the paper I had just turned in and how I was going to spend my weekend. Now he's dead, and the most I can do is listen to Springsteen and remember him when I do. And Dorothy, who had been doing so well, is dead now too. She was sailing along when one complication after another hit her like tidal waves. By the time she died, she had so many things wrong with her that I'm not sure what actually killed her. And Marlo had died between the writing of this book and its publication. In the end, her chemo had irreparably damaged her heart. So, a sincere compliment, a brief sampling of Good Springsteen, my first successful transfer to the ICU, some jokes about providing Marlo with IV benzos, and at the end of my shift, they were all still alive. During my eight hours that day, I tried to help them in whatever way I could. For our patients, there may not be a tomorrow. Today has to count. At the end of the shift, I went home, saw my kids, ate dinner, slept, and showed up at 7 a.m. the next day, ready to do it all over again, this time for 12, not eight hours, another day on the floor. Okay, wow. How do you deal with all the death? You it's... get to know these people, their families, everything. How do you deal with that? Yeah, the most important thing is that we all talk to each other about it. That's tremendously helpful to know that other nurses are grieving and feeling the same pain and we can connect about it. Because if you think about it, the average person, you know, they don't want you to come to a dinner party and say, oh, how's your work? And you say... <laughs> Man, you know, this patient I love just died. And, yeah. uh, you know, people just don't want to hear that. We're not comfortable with that. So knowing I can go to work and talk to people about it is huge. And then it's given me a lot more perspective on my life. It's made me want to make sure I spend time with my kids, that I know what's going on with them. Be nice to my husband, not that that's work, but to focus on that, you know, and not that I can't get uptight about stupid things. I certainly can. Um, but I'm really, really able to put things into a big picture perspective better, and that helps. But it, it's it's hard. And it must be hard. I realize it would put things in perspective really fast. But so when you're with people and they're saying, oh, I'm having such a terrible day. The plumber kept me yeah. waiting for 10 minutes <laughs> and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I said, don't you want to just punch them? Sometimes it's hard. It is hard. I mean, I try to realize that my perspective is unusual. So, um, yeah, but <laughs> oh, I just want to kill them. And I buy a lot of flowers. That's one thing I do to cheer myself up. Is uh, you know, Trader Joe's has these great yeah, flowers that aren't very expensive. So you have expensive. flowers in your house. You mean yeah. yeah you, you, so I try to always have fresh flowers because that looks like life. It does. Yeah. But fresh flowers, I have to tell you, they die pretty fast too. They so do. So maybe you even should with think that about, little packet of right, stuff right. in the water. Maybe, do you plant flowers that come back and are like perennials, resurrected in the spring? I do. I oh, like good. I That's like gardening, but I, yeah, I but, uh, you know. Now, you say, and this makes sense given what, dealing with the reality that you deal with every day, that in nursing school you're taught not to talk about your life. Right. With a patient. So that the patient... I mean, you know everything about the patient's most intimate details. That's true. And, Even and, uh, down to what their colon looks like. Exactly, sometimes. right. Exactly. <laughs> and they know nothing right. about you. You're just these people that come and go and, you know, violate them sometimes and make them feel better at others. And right. Why shouldn't you? I think I do, I, I do understand it, but why right. are you told not to do that? And why have you flouted the rules? Right. So, right. It's the idea of boundaries, that the patient isn't there to hear you go in and talk about your frustration with 
your plumber or, uh, you know, or overwhelm them with stories about your life and also setting up clinical boundaries. It's they're the patient, you're the nurse. But that I realized during my first year that that doesn't work, that people don't want to just be the patient, especially our patients who are there for so many days. Yeah. They don't want to be the patient. They want to be the person. And then for them to be the person, I have to be the person. And that can be really, really nice, I discovered. And I've actually gotten really good advice from patients about my kids, like people with older kids, you know, they'll say, oh, do you have kids and what are their ages? And um, they'll just tell me something that they felt like they learned. And it's really, really nice to have that kind of sharing. So it w would your advice be to the, the nursing schools to uh, ease up on that uh, uh, dictum? Or do you see that there are a lot of nurses who might not know where the line is and, you know, the patient is sort of, well, a captive audience, a very captive audience. Yeah. Yeah. I would say teach that idea of therapeutic boundaries, but then also teach that it is okay to disclose some things about yourself, but that doesn't mean that you go into the patient's room and spend 20 minutes talking about you know how frustrating it was that you had to cook Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, because you got to figure or, some. There'd be a nurse or two that would probably do that. Yeah, right. Because they're sick, they don't want to listen to you complain. No, <laughs> or us. Yeah. Okay, so th that's one thing you learned in nursing school. Amazingly, one thing you didn't learn in nursing school, amazingly, is how to talk to patients and or their families about death. Right. If it's right around the corner. How in the name of God don't they prepare you? I bet that they don't do it to doctors either, I bet. No, they don't. Well, how, I, that is insane. It is insane, yeah. Yeah, well, we're so focused on all the technical skills and understanding how the system works and you know, learning drug names. And all that stuff is, is, of course, crucially important. But the communication piece... And it is true for doctors. It's definitely true. It's crucially important, too, right. I might say. Right. And I think the presumption is most people who go into nursing are kind and well-intentioned and care, which is true. But that doesn't mean, especially if you're 22 and you're fresh out of college, that you're going to know how to talk to someone about the absolute hardest thing they'll ever have to think about in their That's whole right. entire life. Well, in right. your book, you actually have a doctor who's coming in, and the doctor, his job is to tell the patient and the patient's family that, you know, pretty much over. Nothing much we can do anymore. He does that, leaves, and the entire the family and everybody else just sits there with their mouths hanging open, and they frankly don't know what he just said. Right. And so then you find yourself having to try to deal with it then. So that's how badly he did it. That's how, but nobody really tells right. people. And one of the poor family members said, we thought the doctor would give some direction, would say it was time. Yeah. They want to be told that. But I suppose a doctor, for whatever reason, is afraid of making that judgment. I mean, how? Yeah. And how are this, people s supposed to know what to do? This problem of that we don't help people die in the way they would like to. Whether that means in the ICU, full bore, everything possible to keep them alive for one minute longer, which is what some people want. And is insane. Right. Most people don't want that. Yeah. And we don't help the people who don't want that do less. And it's so complicated because all there's of course financial incentives to treat that I don't think consciously motivate anyone but when you've got what you get paid for lining up with in some ways the path of least resistance which is just to go 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 I mean that's right there a conflict of interest and I'm not saying it gets consciously acted out I don't think it does but I think it's an influence and psychologically a doctor and a nurse are trained to uh Help pe cure people, help people right. live, Do and like death is a death is something that is um, well, I guess an indication of failure. Yeah, or right. <laughs> is that right? I Even though it's so, 
natural. Yeah, I don't look at it that way, but people do. <laughs> and there can be cases where people get just very caught up in this person is not going to die. So there can be someone who's usually able to let families have some room to make their own decisions who, because the patient is young or because the patient has young children or, you know, it could be anything um, because the, there are members of the family who are just incredibly insistent that this person cannot die and will not die, that then in that instance, the practitioner just kind of gives in. And we're not, we're not good at living with people when we give them this bad news and having them freak out. We don't see that as normal. Like people freak out well, and then we say, okay, let's do something. <laughs> You know, instead of thinking it's normal to freak out when someone you know is going to die. I've got to take a break, but I want to get into this. Uh, is it what happens when somebody essentially is dead, but you guys don't have the what the proper form that says yeah, right. let them go? Yeah. Yeah. So legally, is that called is that condition A? No. What's that? What what is no, that called? Is that would, it called if, something? So if they don't have a DNR, or a do not resuscitate order. Yeah. Um, or do do not resuscitate, do not intubate. They have different. You've got to go. You've got to. Right. You know what I wrote down on my little notes? You have to abuse a corpse. Yeah. There's yeah. Yeah. That's what it seems like yeah. to me. Yeah. Somebody is essentially dead, and you're what shocking their heart. You're pounding Doing, on them. You're sticking things down there, yeah. and you don't want to, and the, the, the emotional cost to the people in the hospital who are having to yeah. do that is huge. Yes. The outcome cannot be good. The, that is so insane. It, it's insane. Isn't there a better way to yeah. ensure that that doesn't happen? <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure you know this, that when... President Obama tried to introduce the idea oh. that, you know. Oh, you're going to bring up death panel. I am. I okay, am. Go ahead. Bring up death panel. That uh, we should reimburse physicians and nurse practitioners for actually talking with people about not wanting to be abused when they're a corpse. That, yes. And this became the death panel. Right. And pulling the plug on grandma. Which anyone, so, that oh, is such a God. stupid, stupid statement. Anyone who would say something like that has obviously never been in a hospital and been in that situation. There's no plug. There's no, you know, it just doesn't work like that. You don't, yeah. Right. Yeah, right. So. Right. I have, um, I, I have a living will and stuff, and I have put, and they say, do you want to be resuscitated? And I just looked at all, I don't know. I just put no, 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 because I don't ever want to be in that position. On the other hand, it occurred to me, well, maybe there would be an instance where I would want one of those things to happen because I might, how the hell am I supposed to know? Right. Right. That's why it would well, be nice if we could talk to people about these things in a measured, reasonable way because there's a lot of questions people have uh yeah yeah and in the hospital when it happens if you get the palliative care team to come in or ethics they can do a great job i've also seen brand new interns who you know are barely shaving come in and try to have these conversations and they're really terrible at it <laughs> No surprise, like but yeah. um, you know, and then it's good if you can have a nurse there to fill in and interpret and try to flush things out a little bit. But um, we uh, we really fail people at that point. I mean, I would always say it's a huge failure, and we don't make it. Even people who would be in the hospital and be on hospice be hard to. Can we stop giving them heparin shots? Can we? You know, just the whole idea of really just pulling back everything and only doing what will make them feel better. People have such a strong resistance to that in our system, either by virtue of training, personality, inclination, or all three. You're listening to Teresa Brown. She is a nurse here in Pittsburgh. And she is a marvelous writer and an author. And her book, Critical Care, which I've got stuff hanging out of, uh, this is Harper, Harper One, mm -hmm. which is Harper Collins. Right. And uh, it was available 
all over the place. Yeah. Barnes and Noble, Amazon. And uh, yeah. It's it's critically acclaimed. It's really really good. I got to take a break and we got more. And if you have any questions, feel free. I'll share her. Okay? <laughs> we'll be back. More is on the way with Lynn Cullen Live. 36 countries, 150 artisan groups, a world of handmade treasures, and one place to discover them all, 10,000 villages, home decor, jewelry, gifts, all one of a kind, fashioned one at a time. At 10,000 villages, each item tells a story. When somebody else takes that beautiful item, I want to carry that beauty to them. They're gifts that give twice, because 10,000 Villages is a fair trade retailer, providing sustainable income to artisans in developing countries. Fair trade has been the possibility to have what we have now. Enriching their lives while bringing exotic elegance into yours. Surprise your senses. Express your style. Experience the new. Step into 10,000 villages. I feel very beautiful making these products, and I want all our customers to feel beautiful wearing them. Who needs Black Friday? Go to BargBargains.com for great deals every day from the top restaurants, museums, and shows in the Berg. This week, only 60% off gift certificates to Misaki. BargBargains.com, Pittsburgh's exclusive e-commerce mall. BargBargains.com. Now, it's back to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. I kept being distracted by the view. and the Isn't it amazing? Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I, I mean, when there's not a guest here, Teresa was just saying she gets, she's, she's seated, so she's looking out the window at this pretty amazing marvelous view. view. Yes, <laughs> it's amazing. And I'm have my back to it, so I'm not being... <laughs> but, yeah, when I don't have a guest and I'm seated more like uh, this and I, I look over... Yeah, it's... Yeah, Pittsburgh has a great skyline. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. It's a pretty city. Mm -hmm. It's it just is. a flat-out pretty city. Yeah. Yep. Um, so what do you think in, like, 15, 20 years... Or maybe I'll give it a little more. No, I won't. 15, 20 years, we'll look back on some of the things that you as a nurse are doing now to patients and think, what the hell? We're, that it, it, it's yeah. like we look at bleeding. Now. Right. Right. I mean, you know that's going to happen, right? It no? is my deepest wish that we will look back at chemotherapy and say, did you ever, so I'm dating myself, did you ever see that Star Trek movie where they go back in time to save the whales and they... Yes. Well, okay. Well, they they go to the hospital and yes. and Dr. McCoy Bones is in the elevator and some new resident gets too red and they're arguing about what Dr. So and So says about chemotherapy and he says sounds like the well I can't sounds like the go ahead know, yes you can I can't yeah yeah you can okay he says sounds like the goddamn Spanish Inquisition yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see Bones saying that. <laughs> It's always stuck. Not that I feel like that's what I'm doing to people when I give them no, chemo. No, but it's true. But I, I would love, love, love if genetic therapy, targeted therapy, something, something would come along that. Because what we're doing is what chemo is, and you say in the book, it's a Faustian it is, bargain. It is. You're poisoning your body to save it. It's like you know the Vietnam thing. We, we uh, destroyed the village to save it. Right. That, okay. Yeah. Well, so that's the best we can do in a lot. Yeah. And we so we need a new model. And unfortunately, we're there's certain illnesses where we're getting better and better and better, but it's it's so slow. It's such slow progress. And cancer is not just one thing. Cancer is a million different. There's a million. It's not like when will they find a cure for cancer? Well, what cancer? Right, right, right. That's right. That's what we're finding now. Because even say, breast cancer, there's most kinds are extremely treatable, and then there's one kind that's that's called inflammatory breast cancer. That's like a death sentence. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, not not in any kind of immediate way, but right. We can't. Right. We can't get rid of it. We can't. We can control it, but we can't get rid of it. One of the things in reading your book. Um, that you know we 
we all know so many people who have cancer and we know so many people who live with cancer and we know people who've beaten cancer and and in your book geez i only think there was one person who beat it you <laughs> seem like i'm thinking god it's i think you only mentioned this one person who <laughs> yes <laughs> jeez so the people you're dealing with when people are getting i mean cancer often you live with it but usually it gets you in the end right it's a pretty it's, how many people it, really beat it i mean i well, think in the popular press they're trying to tell us and actually a lot of we're people do and and here's the thing when you're working inpatient so in the hospital you're either seeing people who have leukemia, lymphoma, something where the treatment is so severe that they have to be hospitalized for a long time, or we see the people where treatment didn't work. So the breast cancer is now metastatic, or um, you know we got rid of their osteosarcoma, but now it's come back and there's more of it. So that so when I first started working, I thought. God, cancer is horrible. It's such a killer. Right. And and then I realized, no, 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 there's this whole world of outpatient where people are never even in the hospital. Okay, so you're only, that's that's right. what I told myself, too. We're, yeah, so I, it was. The book is called Critical Care. Yes. I mean, you're only dealing with the very, very right, sick. Right, the sickest. And there is a whole world of cancer treatment where people come in, they go to infusion centers. We have great, great, great drugs for nausea now. Just it's it's not at all like what it was 20 years ago. It so really, in 20 really years, isn't. it won't be at all like it is today. I hope that is true. I really I always say it'll be the happiest day of my life if I'm put out of a job. Yeah. Because we cure cancer. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Now, doctors don't do poop. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> There's an entire chapter Doctor, isn't that what it's called? Yeah, doctors don't do poop. Doctors don't do poop. Chapter eight. Yes. <laughs> and I have to give credit to, it was a friend of mine from nursing school who told me that. That's how she summarized her whole final <laughs> clinical. <laughs> she said, this is what it all comes down to. Doctors, doctors. don't do poop. <laughs> no, they don't dirty their hands <laughs> with that kind of life. But you guys. We do. We do poop up, down, and sideways, as I say in the book. How do you get um, sort of inured to that? Well, you did diapers. I mean, you had, does that help? Being That's, a, it's not the same. I think so, but I don't think, I mean, I have a really strong gag reflex. So I've been in, in moments where we've had to clean up people who, thank goodness, they're kind of out of it. Once they're at that level and they're incontinent, there'll be three of us in there cleaning them up. And I'm just, I can't. Gagging. Yeah, and we got out in the hall once, and a friend of mine said, what's the matter with you? You sound like a cat. <laughs> Trying to get a hairball. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I try to just <coughs> breathe through my mouth, concentrate, um, but I, I have never... Um, gotten used to it and it's just part of the job you know but I remember as a nursing student a nurse having to help a guy who was had all this really thick mucus in his mouth and she was helping him and she and I and she was gagging and she said I can handle everything but I hate mucus I can't stand it see this is why I couldn't be a nurse I mean I We've got people now turning the show off. Yeah, right. <laughs> <coughs> it's true. But I thought th she was a great nurse, and if she could still gag over mucus after the many years she'd been a great nurse, then I, with my gag reflex, I would be all right, even oh, if I looked like a cat. Oh, man. <laughs> man. But you know what? I want to talk about it from a patient's perspective. How hard it is to have to surrender your dignity. And for so many people who are by nature sort of private, right. dignified people. I mean, that is the worst thing that can happen to them. Worse than dying is this embarrassment yeah. of having strangers have to tend to their most intimate details. I, it, is, you, it is hard, and that's why it's important to be professional, but also kind 
compassionate. And people will say I'm so embarrassed. And, you know, we just always say, it's okay. We yeah. don't care about this. It doesn't matter to us. And it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, so the, the fact that I sometimes have this physiological reaction, it doesn't reflect my mood, my feelings, anything. I just feel bad for them. And, and I remember a patient, he'd been a long-term patient and had actually been doing really, really well. And then all of a sudden just could not get up and go to the bathroom on his own. It took four of us to help him. And we helped him and got him back in the bed. And he said, well, ladies, this is pretty terrible, but I have to say... You made it as good as it possibly could be. Wow. And that was really wonderful. Do you find that a lot of patients, when they should be the focus, are always trying to, like, I mean, they're trying to be good. They're try I mean, there are patients who don't give a damn about being nice to you, and then there are patients who, even in their distress. Yes, are always looking out for us. And some people, I think it's like what we were talking about before, that they want to be the person, too. They don't want to be right. the only the only source of problems, um, and they want to say, how are you? And they want an honest answer because they don't want them to always be the neediest person around. I think some people, though, it is a sort of compulsion to be a good patient, and I think that's how I would probably be, too. Like, too. Although, as a nurse, I've learned that it's those patients don't necessarily get what they want, and there's moments when you should just say, I need this now, you know, like if it's something really important um, and in general, be nice. But there's times when you have to push. But I think there are some people who feel like, yeah, I've got to be good. And it really, really comes out so often when people are talking to the doctor because they'll be complaining and complaining that I have this pain and this isn't working and that. And I'm worried about this. And then the doctors come in on rounds and, oh, everything's fine. No, I'm fine. It's all fine. Well, see, it, I was uh, surprised at how much you and the other nurses were afraid to talk to the doctors. That can, yeah. And if you're afraid to talk to them, right. lest you step on their immense egos and, you know, and impatience and whatever, um, how the hell is a patient supposed to? Right, because they're... How do we bring right. doctors down off their yeah. mountains? Well, I think, I'm not sure all of them are up there. In fact, I think probably most aren't, but there's so, well, what we talked about, we're not teaching communication. Nurses aren't trained how to work with doctors. Doctors aren't trained how to work with nurses. And so we all just fall into these roles where we're not really expecting each other to talk to each other. And the more comfortable I got in the job, like now if I wrote this book, it would be, completely different. I mean, I would be in on rounds and be in rooms saying, but you were concerned about, mm -hmm. didn't you want to mention, because I feel that is the nurse's role to help the patient actually bring the complaints the doctor needs to know about to the doctor's attention. Um, You're a patient advocate in this yes, situation. Yes, definitely. But as a first year nurse, you were, did not feel comfortable. No, and the system doesn't encourage nurses to so, do that and doesn't encourage uh, doctors to want us to do that. So the system, I hate to say this, the system sucks a lot. In a lot of ways, it, it does. really does. Yeah. And there's got to be better ways. You think somebody, are the hospitals in some other country run in a more reasonable way, do you think? You don't know enough about that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um... I don't think so, but what I do see now is this movement to talk about teams in healthcare and realize that everyone has a contribution to make. And then also patient advocacy is getting more and more prominent. So I was just on this TED Med panel. You know, TED Med's the big, they have a big conference every April in DC where they bring together all kinds of thinkers to talk about how to make medicine better. And they've got these 20 great challenges, and one of them is the role of the patient. So they asked me to be on that panel, and it was me and this guy who's a patient advocate and other people who aren't healthcare practitioners. Well, one of them is another nurse. And, oh, and a family practice doc, I'm sorry. But people who work on, all they're doing is thinking about how to make the system better for patients. And it was fascinating, it was fascinating to hear their thoughts and 
and say, let's make the system better and see us as people and not be so rushed. And, and, it's, and then it's money. It's of like, course. I was going to say, know. then you're going to bump into money. Right. So let's be more humane. Let's realize these <coughs> are people here. This is like your mother there, your brother, your sister there. And how would you want them to be treated? And then, well, I'm sorry, that's just not cost effective. Right. So, right. So we need to find a way to put pressure on the system that that becomes the default. Yeah. This country is so screwed up about health care. It is a joke. Yeah. I, not, not, I mean, you're, you're in the trenches, but I'm the overall, the, the, the unbelievable. I got to take a break. I'm getting annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to Teresa Brown, nurse, author, mother, and uh, this is her book, which is called Critical Care, and it's uh, a memoir, essentially, of her first year in oncology nursing here in Pittsburgh. It's a doozy. Um, we'll be back. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. Winter has arrived and it's cold outside. So get to Littles for all your UGG needs. Littles has UGGs for men, women, and children to stay warm with shearling lined boots, shoes, and slippers. And don't forget to get your hats, gloves, scarves, and more. All available at Littles Shoes. Bring the entire family to view one of the largest in-store UGG shops in the U.S. Littles Shoes, Pittsburgh's largest family shoe store. 5850 Forbes Avenue in Squirrel Hill. Pittsburgh City Paper is available now. Pick up one today for a preview of Southside Stories at City Theater. Plus, Kevin Smith, B.B. King, the music of Michael Jackson, and the Winter Flower Show at Phipps. Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout Western Pennsylvania and on the web at pghcitypaper.com and on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. I didn't know about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease until I took the wheel and lent my support to drive for COPD. Help Americans take action against this leading cause of death by logging on to driveforcopd.org to learn more. I'm Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson, and I drive for COPD. Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. And welcome back. Um, my guest, Teresa Brown, RN, right? Is yes. that the right? Uh, RN, PhD. <laughs> She got more letters after her name. I mean, you could. You could be really I could. obnoxious. I could. You could, in fact, yeah. call yourself doctor. I could. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm Dr. Brown, your nurse. Yes. Yes. Well, why don't you do that? Especially if, the do- if your patient's a doctor, an MD. Hello, I'm Dr. Brown, your nurse. Exactly. Well, what I think is... We should all be on a first name basis. There you go. So I want doctors to be first names. Our nurses first names and yes. doctors are not. Yes. That's disgusting. Well, and doctors and patients. I hate it. And, you know, especially now the doctors are all younger than me, you know, and, and they use my first name. But right. I'm supposed to be doctor so-and-so to them. The hierarchical crap yeah. that goes on. And, right. And so my husband's a professor. You know, and he doesn't sit in faculty meetings and say, so, Professor Brown, did you talk to Professor Smith? <laughs> but I've been in meetings with doctors. Well, they'll talk about each other as Dr. So-and-so. Yeah, it's really. And I mean, if it's, it's a, a common last name, you don't even know who they're talking about. Yeah, doctors. I'm telling you, they need to be brought down a peg or two. Just, you know, for, we all have a <laughs> yeah. first name. We're all people. <laughs> Okay. We can all share yeah. and respond and that would, to our first name. <laughs> and that would go a, a, a fur piece, if you ask me, in making it would. the whole medical experience more tolerable, just making it more right. human and less frightening, less uh, imposing. Right. right. Less. Bleh. Anyway, Barbara sent a great email. She quotes someone 
in the new from the new republic among the elderly the struggle against disease has begun to look like the trench warfare of world war 1 that is so mm. right our main achievements today consist of devising ways to marginally extend the lives of the very sick Ours is now a medicine that may doom most of us to an old age that will end badly, with our declining bodies falling apart as they always have, but devilishly and expensively stretching out the suffering and decay. Whoa. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely. Yeah. And that's because we cannot discuss. We cannot deal with death because then certain freaked out hysterics start screaming death panels. What do we do, she asked, about the problem of the expense of extending life? Some incredible percentage of all the uh, expense of medical care that you will consume in your lifetime uh, happens like in the last week, right? right? Insane. Insane. Right. You're dying. It's the last week. Right. So we're going to throw $5 million at it. and she says, you know, we're hearing so much about the cost of Medicare and its impact, but what, what, what? I don't know. What? Well, it's not your job. No, no, that's, I'm thinking it's about, um, job, though. there was an op-ed in the New York Times a couple months ago by Stephen Ratner, and the first line was, we need death panels. Yes. And he said, we need, no one wants to talk about rationing, but we need a common sense approach to are the things we're doing when people are really, really sick and old. But how do we even have that conversation when you cannot talk about death and dying to 90% of the people? Our culture does not recognize it. We don't deal with it at all. Yeah, I mean, Atul Gawande had a great col- I mean, article in The New Yorker a few years ago about this, and it, there's a hospital where every single patient who comes in, every single time they come in, they go through some sort of do not resuscitate form. Like, no matter what you come in for, you got an ingrown toenail, you talk about the form. Um, and in that hospital, in the ICU, it was not filled with people wanting all these prolong my life for five more minutes, please, mm-hmm. measures. Mm-hmm. And it was that you introduced that idea every single time people came in, and they just got used to having to think about it. Well, there it. is a hospital here that I sometimes frequent that if you go in for anything that when and the intake thing, even for a test or something, they always do say, do you have a do not... Re- they do ask right. you that yeah. every time, mm-hmm. every time. And I always say yes, but, you know, it's in a drawer in my house. But, you know, you guys don't know anything about That's it. That's the thing. If every time every person who came in filled out a new form, and then it needs to be an easy form. That's the other thing. People can get so focused on the form. The form needs this and the form needs that. And it's not about the form. It's about thinking about your own death, I see. That's the problem. The, the form is not the challenge. It's the problem the idea, is nobody wants challenge. to think of their own death. But it's, it, you know, and also if you show patients, and there's research on this, videos of what resuscitation is like. Oh, you show them the abuse right. of a corpse I was right. talking about. Here's what's going to happen right. to you. You show people a video as opposed to talking about it and the vast majority of people will say, I don't, I don't want, want that. that. I don't want that. I don't want that. Not if I'm on my way out anyway, essentially. I don't right. want that. What's the point of that? Yeah. And I learned that came out of uh, an ED doc who would take people to the ICU and show them a ventilator and a patient on a ventilator. And then the ICU said, you can't keep bringing these people in here to teach this but lesson. But we do need to so, be. But, so then he made the videos. Yeah. Okay. That's smart. Yeah. Now, yeah. oh God, where's the time going? There is something in your book that so enraged me, and in you very matter-of-factly talk about it, um, and you had just mentioned that there's now units that do this, units that do that. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the IV unit. Now, this is somebody who specializes in putting in a very specific I, kind right. of IV for chemo, or no, not for chemo, for well, whatever. Really for anyone. Just, okay. Yeah. But it's not something that you as a nurse are necessarily trained to do. No. I mean, now now I am because I'm doing a different job and I've learned how to do it. But right. Uh, a Fair, lot, specialized. We, we don't learn it in school anymore. You needed the IV unit yes. for this particular patient. Yes. The IV unit responded that he that patient's a jerk, essentially. Right. And we won't come. Right. 
I was dumbfounded. How dare they? What the hell is their job? Their job is not to... But yeah. how aren't they tossed out on their ears? I don't understand that. They refuse to come. Yeah, it's... See, look at you. You don't even think it... Really, Did you, you didn't even react to that. Well, I reacted to it as, how am I going to fix this? I think that I try to just be very problem-approached. And then, like I say in the book, the fellow came up and called them and said, if you're not going to do this, okay, we'll document that the patient couldn't get the treatment they needed, and it's going to be on you. And it's, It'll be you on know, you if they die. Yeah, but we shouldn't have to call in a well, fellow to have people do their jobs. No, you're right. Well, did anything go into these SOBs files? I would not want the, these people do not belong in a hospital. It's refused to come. It comes up because there are patients who can be... Difficult. Not, not just, yeah, beyond diff verbally abusive, physically okay. abusive, and then... Tough. Goes with the territory. Well, and that, Right. So where do you draw the line? So that um, is a hard... Uh... Uh, <laughs> oh, if I rule the hospital! <laughs> now... Nurses are often called angels of mercy, and we have the Florence Nightingale, you say, said that it was an art. Nursing is yes. an art. And if I weren't wearing this jacket, you'd see my wings. Yeah, she has yeah, wings. Exactly. And she's just, she's, yeah. you know. They're beautiful. Okay, yeah. but then you talk about <laughs> certain nurses that are just nurse ratchets. Yes. Jerks. Yes. Like uh, humiliating other nurses. Yes. Okay, um, how does somebody with that personality become a nurse and how do you protect people like me from them? Yeah, the, the truth is the nurses I've seen be really hard on other nurses and hard on younger doctors so they can get away with it, um, be ways they would never treat an attending physician, but the interns are easy targets. I actually saw them all being good with patients. Oh, okay. So, they just abuse uh, yes. employees. Yes. I mean, although I have gotten feedback from people, comments on my writing, where a lot of people do feel like they're bullied by nurses. I just personally didn't see that. Um, so, But if that does happen, I would speak up appropriately, talk to the unit director, and there's o there should always be a patient relations department in a hospital. And for the most part, those people take complaints very seriously. If someone is just abusive and you feel like they're not giving you good care, or for whatever reason, you can always request not to have that person take care of you, and that request should be honored. So look out for yourself, definitely. Yeah, oh yeah. Definitely look out for yourself and speak up and just be appropriate. I mean, always in all things, be appropriate. But if someone is not doing their job and is making you feel scared or belittled, then that's not okay. And what I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of us working in healthcare, as you just noticed, get used to this. And then we don't react maybe the way we should. And so if patients can speak up and be appropriate, Maybe things will start going in people's files. Maybe there will be conversations about, you know, whatever's going on with you, you can't bring it to work. Right. Because we're not good at doing that to each other. No, I, you know, systems just start going. They, they, they're these entities in and of themselves, and some, so an outsider looking in can say, this doesn't make any This is stupid. This right. doesn't make any sense. But, you know, you don't even notice. Right. And in, and in that job where there was a lot of nurses eat their young, which is this horrible phrase that we hear and use to describe nursing, every, everyone knew what was going on. It wasn't like this was a secret for management. How is the influx of more males into nursing uh, been greeted? Is it because I'm always sort of surprised when I go into a hospital and I've bump into uh -huh. male nurses. A guy, there are yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my sense or our sense is that it helps. It's good because that cattiness that w some women fall into is much less likely to work with guys. Yes. 
Uh, what does seem to happen is that a lot of the guys get drawn to highly technical areas, so ICUs, ED, which is okay. But um, but I work with men in oncology, and and they're great. And I you know not that men are perfect, but they <laughs> but they uh, certainly have not been raised up from kindergarten through high school with this like mean backstabbing way that women can be to each other. Oh, mean girls. Yes, yes. Ray writes, in 1995, my father died of a cancer that I was also diagnosed with 10 years later. At the time, oh, look what time it is. I'm sorry. At the time of my father's diagnosis, I was in the doctor's office with dad, clearly on his way out in a most God awful way. Mm. I asked the doctor what we do next, and he responded, well, he'll have good days and bad days. Try to enjoy the good ones. We then found ourselves outside in the sunshine on our own. We did not find any help or compassion until we got to the hospice stage months later. When I close my eyes and picture that day in the doctor's office, I am not angry. I can see in the doctor's face a sort of panic at the question and a relief when he got the answer out. He had no idea what to tell us. Thank your guest for her compassion and kindness. It matters to we who suffer alone. Aww. Yeah. I'll just make a pitch for hospice being oh, yeah. wonderful. Oh, and, yeah. And a lot of doctors don't want to bring up hospice because people hear it as death. But it's not. It can help oh, no. people it's wonderful. stay alive with a great quality of life, feel like there's a huge support system there. It's... It can be really, really wonderful. Exactly. I've experienced it with my father, and uh, wow. Wow. Well, there is so much to talk about, I didn't get around to half of it. Uh, it was great being here. It was fun. I love your passion. Thank you. I love your passion. Teresa Brown, may she be on my floor when I get stuck in a hospital. <laughs> I'll give you a run for your money. <laughs> yes, I will. Yes, I will. Her book, Critical Care, her and read her online at Opinionate New York. Yeah, Where's Opinionator. It go? How do you get there? Yeah, if New you York go Times. New York Times. If you do Teresa Brown Bedside, because my actual column is called Bedside, okay. it'll come up. Teresa Brown Bedside. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Pleasure. And uh, see you guys tomorrow. Lynn Cullen Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Cullen Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.